minus 30 seconds. T minus 20 seconds. Welcome to Trap Talk Reptile Network, the coolest reptile network in the world. What's up, everybody? It's Joe DeStefano from Meteoric Serpents, and I am joined here with Alvaro from Clover's Reptiles for the third installment of Thank God It's Colubrids, and me and Alvaro are going to be on every other week switching off with uh, Junior. So what's up, Alvaro? What's going on, Joe? What's up, everybody? Tonight, man, um, really excited for this, man. It's um, you know bringing more colubrids to the trap talk and the network and basically the world. Hell yeah, yeah! I think it's awesome. Um, super appreciative to MJ for letting us do this because um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about a lot of species and hopefully. In the name of my own podcast, co corrupt a bunch of people to get into colubrids because I just think they're an amazing group of snakes, um, and I think they need more love in the hobby. So, um, yeah, super cool. Um, yeah, so guys, just a little bit about us, just a little background. Again, I'm Joe Stefano from Meteoric Serpents. You can see my Instagram right here, and Alvaro, you could go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah. So again, guys, Alvaro Clover's Reptiles, all social media. Make sure you guys uh, follow us on Instagram. We have our own YouTubes um, and as well a couple of podcasts. You know, I scaled uh, Success Reptile Podcast on my YouTube channel. So make sure you guys follow us on there. And um, I mainly do hog nose. So we're gonna definitely going to talk some hog nose and other colubrids. Yep. Yep, for sure. Guys, uh, we wanted to say what's up to everybody in the chat tonight before we get into everything. So let's see who is here tonight. We got some V Unit members, I know, and some Trap Talk Patreon members. Eric's More Factory, one of our V Unit homies. What's up, man? Thanks for being here. Mike, 1776 Exotics. I know you're the OG Patreon member for MJ. So what up, dude? Greg. Lovato, another V unit member. Thanks for being here. Brian, Heath and Hatchery, Trap Talk Patreon member and V unit member. What's up? Thanks for being here. Shane from Above All Scales, uh, also Patreon member, V unit member. What's up? Cody from Morph Kings. Thanks for being here. Trap Talk Patreon member. Thanks for being here. Chantel from Pacific Rim Serpents. I think you're in the V unit too. I know you're a Patreon member as well, but thanks for being here. Alex, V unit member all day. Thanks for being here. Becky, what's up? Thanks for tuning in. James, JNS Exotics, what is up? Lori Cooper, hope you're doing well. Thanks for being here. What's up? I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but appreciate you being here. Uh, Justin, thanks for coming out. We got Patrick Holmes. Thanks for being here, man. Appreciate you. Ending off with the uh, VPI villain himself, head honcho of the V Unit fam, Villarino Reptiles, also Trap Talk Patreon member. Guys, before we get into it, of course, um, just a couple things to talk about. First, uh, everyone should be supporting US ARC. That is the second link in the description below. Make sure you're checking it out. Um, US ARC, guys, if you don't already know what it is, this is the basically organization that fights for our rights as reptile keepers to fight against any legislation that's going through... Um, on a statewide or national level when it comes to, you know, um, 
you know, legislation against reptile keeping. There's some things that are ongoing or have been ongoing, like in Florida, the iguana ban, things like that. So if you're supporting U.S. Arc, you should also support U.S. Arc Florida. Guys, the membership for both of those, the lowest tier membership is so, so affordable, um, in my opinion. And this may come off as harsh, but if you can afford to feed your animals, you can afford a U.S. Arc membership. So make sure you join because uh, you're just supporting your own rights to keep your animals every day. All right. If I can find it. This episode is also brought to you by the chipper, CocoDude.com. Go to CocoDude.com and enter TrapFam24 uh, to get 24% off your chipper or cocoa to go products for the entire year. Uh, so go check that out. I personally use it. Uh, across all my species i love the chipper i personally use the chipper product we are here in florida where it is very humid and yeah i don't really need the coco to go product so go check it out and use that promo code tonight's episode is also brought to you by blake's exotic feeders guys i talk about blake on my own show just because i want to give him props and and promotion but uh here on trap talk reptile network we fully support uh blake's exotic feeders he breeds quail in-house raised by hand uh just a great way to vary up your diet especially for colubrids who uh many of them are bird eaters in the wild so I think it's super good to vary up your diet. Rodents are a bit fattier. These quail are a bit leaner. And all of my rat snakes in particular just absolutely love quail. So I think you should go check it out for yourself. If you are interested, send him a DM. Um, that way he can hook you up on shipping. If you go through the website, uh, it's going to default to shipping price. So go hit him up directly and see what you can do and say that uh, Trap Talk sent you. Last but not least, this episode is also brought to you by Mark Bailey Reptiles. Guys, Mark Bailey is an absolute OG in this game. And while he's mostly known for nowadays with the ball pythons, I know that he is an OG in the colubrid industry as well. I actually would really love to talk to him about his perspective from the past, um, you know, breeding colubrids. I know he's mostly focused about ball pythons. And speaking of that, he has some absolute killer production. Again, OG in the game. Uh, he has some of the best stuff out there. So go check out Mark Bailey Reptiles. And yeah. Guys, all right. That is all. So we're kind of getting into it here. Um, one thing I wanted to say before we actually kind of started talking, we are absolutely, uh, we want to kind of interact with the chat a bit. So all questions are absolutely welcome. If you want to get our attention better, only because, you know, me and Alvaro obviously want to have a good back and forth. If you want to get our attention better, send a super chat. Uh, it does not have to be a crazy amount. Just drop a super chat and we will absolutely hit your question as soon as there's a break in conversation. But uh, yeah, so what's up, man? Glad to be here on the Trap Talk Reptile Network. I hear that, brother. Before we start off, I want to tell everybody hit the like button. Make sure we get those likes up for the tonight's show. Um, you know, and Facts. subscribe to the channel. Yeah. Sorry. I totally forgot to say that, but yes, hit that like Sweet. button, hit that subscribe. Let's go guys. Um, two, two heads are better than one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, man. Um, I wanted to start off by again, kind of us just introducing ourselves a little bit and our collection and, and kind of talk about our background in the hobby. So if you don't mind, can you kind of go into, uh you know what what you're doing over at clover's reptiles yeah man um you know and i've said this before um i'm brand new into the community um you know i have my second breeding season started this week or last weekend uh you know eggs dropping already um but mainly concentrating well all concentrating currently right now on western hog nose um you know it's a second breeding season and it's going great had a great first year um you know hit the luck of the odds on, on a lot of stuff, had a lot of eggs. Uh, this year I'm almost doubling my production and, you know, just been in, hitting it hard. 2023 was hit from January 1st. I hit the ground running and it's paid off, man. Um, yeah. That, you know, and this year thinking about, well, not thinking, I am going to add uh, two other colubrid species to be named yet. Um, 
this year. So, you know, nice. just starting to grow the collection. And now that I have, you know, that, I think that was my my uh, concentration, getting at least two uh, hog nose seasons, successful season under my belt, and then nice. bringing something else on. Yeah. yeah hundred percent. Yeah. And I have to give you all the props in the world, dude. I've done it before between my own show and, and just publicly like, dude, you came in this game, you hit the ground running and you like, you set out to do what you did and you probably exceeded that by a lot. I mean, guys, Alvaro is no joke, especially when it comes to like his professionalism. I vented with Alvaro before I am personally friends with Alvaro. Cause we live in a, a pretty close proximity. He's down in Miami. I'm up in uh, Boca Raton, which we're only about an hour apart. So uh, very glad to be, you know, friends in real life with Alvaro. Uh, but yeah, his Hognose production is unbelievable. And, you know, Hognose are awesome and taking the world by storm right now, especially in the Kluber world and the reptile industry as a whole in general, honestly. Yeah. Uh, they've become one of those, those uh, staple, like, pet animals that you just are starting to see everywhere. For sure, man. You know, and it's crazy, you know, about Hognose, because um, I got into Hognose because of my daughters, um, you know, and I fell in yeah. love with them. But just generally colubrids, it's what attracts me to the reptile world. Um, there's a few lizards here and there and others, um, you know, like tree, uh, like dwelling um, pythons and stuff like that. Um, but colubrids is definitely going to be the concentration of my collection I mean, yeah. for the long haul, I see. Yeah, 100%. And just to give a little background about myself, guys. Um so, yeah, obviously, if you couldn't tell, I'm relatively young. I'm 23 years old. I got my first snake at 10 years old, uh, who I still have here in my collection. Uh, she's great. Um, but, yeah, it's honestly grown. And that first snake was a Texas rat snake, by the way. Up in New York City, you're not allowed to have pythons. So I couldn't be that guy who had a ball python as his uh, first pet. So um, it all started with the Texas rat snakes and, you know, I worked at a pet store for a very long time. I got hands-on breeding experience with many species of reptiles, which included a few different species of colubrids, some uh, corns, kings, and milk snakes. So that really, you know, having that keeping and breeding experience, um, that kind of fostered my desire to do it on my own uh, within my own collection. And I wasn't allowed to for a very long time, but I'm very glad to say that over the last few years, um, I've been able to build a pretty, it's still a relatively small collection, but a pretty substantial collection of, uh, different colubrid species, as well as I, I do keep ball pythons. Um, but I've definitely been trending in the direction of more colubrids because, dude, I just freaking love them. And when it comes to colubrids, I'm definitely more focused on the rat snake species. Uh, as mentioned, um, the Texas rat snakes are like my one true love in the reptile hobby. That was my first species. Can't see myself not ever having one. So um, I breed those pretty readily. I have eggs currently, a uh, nice clutch of six and another female about to drop. So that's awesome. I keep a couple of the porphyracea subspecies. Those are the bamboo rat snakes. I have a couple of the Thai locality and the Chinese locality. Um, and then I recently got into rhino rat snakes, which are like my dream species. Uh, I'm super excited to be keeping those, but yeah. Um, yeah, guys, I, ju I just love, absolutely love colubrids and cannot see myself being in this hobby again. Like my my whole reason, what what got me to where I am were colubrids, because like I said, New York City, we weren't allowed to have pythons at that at that pet store. So I got all hands on with all these colubrids and they're just awesome, man. So, yeah, that that's kind of a bit about me. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, like how that first uh what's it called introduction to the reptile world really a lot of times sets your um your future of what you're gonna yeah. do right um yeah so it's very interesting you know because me getting back into reptiles was the hog nose and like i said colubrids after the last two years just researching all that stuff i have a long list of colubrids i want to keep yeah 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 definitely man and you know part of 
you know, because like I, I talked about this with uh, Stephen Cush on my own podcast. Just co- if we're looking at colubrids in general, um, one, colubrids are the largest denomination of like a group of snakes. You know, when we're talking about like colubrids, pythons, boas and, and elapids and whatnot, like colubrids make up the largest group without a doubt. And if you look at the amount of snakes that are just colloquially called rat snakes, I, you could almost dare to say that that surpasses the amount of rat snakes by themselves surpasses the amount of possibly all python species and that's not even talking about all king snakes, milk snakes and and everything else. Um so yeah, it it's just super interesting. There's so much out there and even within these species they're so variable. So I I think um you know, colubrids are a great stepping stone for anyone and and they're just a real staple to the hobby man for sure man do you think um you know talking about like being a staple where do you think uh colubers are going to be in the next five years in our hobby i think they're going to keep continuing to grow in popularity i feel like i've seen the trickle over the last couple years on social media. Um, obviously, we saw the craze, and I can definitely speak to it because I work with the ball pythons. Obviously, we've seen the craze that ball pythons have had over the last few years, especially with COVID and whatnot. But I think there's a lot of people who might be getting, I don't I don't want to say bored, but they want to branch out. Um, also, in, in my opinion, I, I think I would be bored if I only kept one species. Like, because it's just like, okay, you see the same behaviors every day. Like, you want that new thing. You want to uh, chase keeping something else. And also, a lot of the care of these species are relatively overlappable. I'm not going to say that everything is is exact, but a lot of these species you can keep the exact same way and obviously between different species there's a ton of variety so i think we're only going to see the popularity of these animals grow year over year i agree i mean as we were talking you know um where we're talking about the the quantity uh, on morph market and stuff like that of, of colubrids right now hognose are overtaking the most of the colubrid within the colubrid um What's it called? Um, yeah, group. It, it's it's hognose, right? Um, yep. And then there's there's stuff that's coming right behind it that are becoming more popular. That now we're gonna be able to uh, readily have captive born and bred stuff. Um, I think that's that's I think that's the um, the key right there, right? Once we're able to pr- produce captive born and bred things, then it is just you know trickle. It just basically uh, rolls out. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll give a a shout out to like someone like Patrick Holmes, because I know he's keeping some rarer uh, Asian rat snake species that just aren't common in captivity or or being captive bred, at least like a lot of people have them, but a lot of them are wild caught. Um, Yeah. So a lot of that stuff. So I I think we're going to keep continuing to grow and just expand the amount of actual species that we see here in captivity. And a lot of that is probably going to come from the colubrid side of things. I agree. Yeah, man. Yeah. And and North America, we have such a variety just within our own, you know, country here. Um, so that's, that's another cool part about that. Right. Um, Yeah. What, what do you think if, if you had to categorize one trait of a colubrid that most, um, catches your attention, what would it be? I think it's color. I I think it's color variability, dude. I mean, yes. Again, I'm going to go back and say them again. While the ball pythons have all these mutations just across all these different species, man. um, And even within the same species, so much variability. I, I talked about them before, the Texas rats. Like, I have multiple normal Texas rats. They might be het for other things, but like they're normals. And no two look alike. I if I had them sitting in a tub, if I put all them in one tub, I can easily pick them all apart and know which one is which because that's how variable they are, which I think is just one of the best parts about it cuz you get to see these different animals and obviously, you know, you want different stuff and then with that, you get to take 
the best traits that you like from each animal and, and you can line breed stuff super easily. Like that's the one thing I'm excited about with the Texas rats. Like not many people look at them highly, but um, I just want to see what I can do, man, in terms of color palette patterns, things like that and, and across different mutations and whatnot. So uh, that's the beauty of it. And I know it is with the hog nose too, with all the different, you know, mm -hmm. colored and patterns and stuff. Yeah, man. You know, um, that was that was exactly the top of my list, color. Um, yeah. Because any of the stuff that I want in my collection, first thing to catch me is color, either a mutation or just a general wild type. Um, I mean, you think about it, some colubrids wild types come in blue, greens, reds, oranges, you know, um, and then right. like you said, from there, line breeding those colors and those genetics, you know, the what's yeah. it called sky's the limit there so yeah you know and, and, and uh, go ahead no i wanted to bring up this comment i i'm sorry if i mispronounce it is it a a shob or a shob uh, a shub um yeah activity levels is a huge thing too especially because i i've talked to multiple uh dry markon keepers and spilotes keepers um the, and even like false water covers and stuff and like how they keep them in these big ass vivariums um, that they're able to see so much activity and movement. So, yes, I, I totally agree. I think that's a huge part to it. Uh, you definitely get more of the activity levels out of the true diurnal species as opposed to the crepuscular ones. And for those who don't know what crepuscular means, it means that they come out mostly at dawn and dusk uh, to feed and and whatnot they're mostly hiding during the day yeah but yeah no, i agree and guys we're not picking on ball pythons when we're comparing things um but it's a good comparison because some ball python <laughs> because it's a good comparison because man that's the, the majority of the market and um just just in general when like the general public thinks about snakes a lot of times it's, it's a ball python um you know so yeah. there's there's always going to be a comparison and metric to be able to um, compare to the ball python, ball python market because every other species wants to get to that prestigious level that the pythons have, the ball pythons have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We're talking just snakes. I mean, that's not even taking into account like leopard geckos and crested geckos. Cause of course those are, those are some of the big ones too. Um, but yeah, we, you know, s snakes, colubrid. So we're going to stick to, you know, top dogs are, uh, I mean, ball pythons, without a doubt, are the most popular pet snake out there. Just just by sheer numbers, like they have to be. Uh, I know Junior would disagree with me because I've heard him say on this segment a couple times, like hognose have to be number one. And to be honest, if he says that, I I don't know. Then I I actually don't know the genuine answer. But just seemingly to me, it's ball pythons. But who knows? Yeah. You see, at numbers, it has to be ball pythons. I mean, and I'm a yeah. hognose person. Ball pythons. Yeah. Um, you know, now I'm with Junior on the actual uh, keeping the animal and, and the activity. It's, yeah, it's got to be hog nose. Yep. You know. Gotcha. Um. So yeah. with and you know, let's get let's get into some like our own collection and stuff of that. You uh, you know, we talk about you have your rat snakes and stuff. Yep. Um, and was when was your first production year? When did you first produce? So the first time I ever hatched animals was 2017. Um, I hatched a couple Texas rats at home. Um, I only had a couple animals in the collection and it was, what was it? It was a joint pairing. I'm trying to remember. In 2017, it was a joint pairing between my snake and one of the ones at the pet store I worked at. Um, nothing in 2018. Then in 2019, I had another clutch and those two were fully my snakes. So I produced snakes for myself. And then my, the dad of that clutch also followed a, another clutch at the pet store. So there was technically like one and a half there. Um, and then there was not anything for quite some time. And then last year I had had some more, I had, okay. uh, technically, uh, a what, what was the rats, reason, a clutch of yeah. ball pythons what was the reason in the in the, in the break just life and school and you know stuff? what yeah it wasn't any specific sort of reason so i i was you know i was living in new york at the time um 
you know, in the house we were in, I wasn't able to achieve brumation very well just because of how I kept like I was in glass tanks uh, for a very long time. I am most I keep in rack systems at, right now. Um, I was in tanks. I there what I didn't really have ways to control what I was doing and I was limited to like just my room and I wasn't allowed to have a lot of animals. So just wasn't really able to get it down. Um, obviously I would have liked to, and, you know, I was pushing to my parents. I was like, Hey, let me do this. Let me, let me get more. Let me do this. And it didn't really happen. And that's okay. When I moved to Florida, that's when I kind of, uh, just started going ham on building this collection and stuff. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so last year was now, you know, your big production year, right? It was the first year as, as meteoric serpent. That's number okay. one, but yeah, it, I, I'd call that my first like legit year of, of breeding reptiles. But like, again, I've been doing this for a while. And even, even those clutches I mentioned at the pet store, like with the other species, like I was the one who was, feeding pairing and hatching these babies um so i i not that they were mine but i take a lot of credit for the production yeah. so yeah yeah you you already had experience that you know under your belt that you know you were able to produce some some good stuff what was your best production last year you think what was your your prize jewel out of the cluebirds oh man my fries because it was all texas rats but uh we proved out so i did a joint pairing with my buddy kevin sheehan from offspring reptiles he vents tinley if anyone's familiar with him um he sent me a scaleless annery texas rat male that was possible het leucistic and he did in fact prove het leucistic so he's probably the most powerful texas rat that's out there um and we produced a, cl a mixed clutch of scaleless double het leucistic annery and scaleless leucistics het for annery um but one of the scaleless uh, sorry both of the scaleless double hats that i kept back from that clutch it's a 1.1 are just amazing animals it's two of the best texas rats i've ever seen especially on the scaleless side um i just cannot wait to grow them up because those snakes only get better with age so that's what really made me excited um yeah and it's pushing me to continue that project what what about you with the hogs because obviously you know you're doing a lot of a lot of morph breeding as well so i'm sure you and and i know you hit some like really cool stacked animals yeah man um i mean we're talking about just genetics you know triple you know visual stuff um arctic coral so you know arctic is a um a cold dom or incomplete dominant so yep. whichever you know term we're, we're, we want to call it um but you know arctic's incomplete dominant and then uh lavender recessive albino recessive so i have arctic corals and it's crazy because nice. that um that clutch i should have only had hit i think one i hit two arctic corals and two visual corals nice um where i should you know the odds just killed it um, so that, that was, that was cool. But I think my favorite man was, um, some Arctic sable, uh, stuff that I kept back. Um, okay. like a, a really, a male that's really cool is, um, super, so almost a full black stripe down his back and stuff like that. Yeah. After it starts shedding. Um, so that's really cool. I mean, this year is a year that I have two or three animals that I'm just waiting to first of all, prove some stuff out and okay. just even, just even the byproducts of what's coming out of those animals, um, are going to be crazy. You know, nice. that I'm, I'm looking forward to. Yeah. You know. Um, and I could say with, with your stuff, I mean, so obviously I, I'm not really, I don't have any hogs, but, uh, one of my favorites that you hit that you, you had on your table at multiple shows. And I still don't know how it didn't sell was it was an azanthic combo. I really like what Azanthic does in the hogs, man, because they do have that base yellow color, obviously. So they, that Azanthic really strips it away and leaves you with a black and white snake, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Or it's kind of like grayish and gray and black. Um, but that one was really cool. Yeah. So. Man, and, and you know, I'm, I still have that animal. And yeah. at this point, <laughs> I'm almost going to keep it. And it's um, 
and his antic toffee belly um so double vision recessive visual um called the toxic um and okay. he has a um it's called rb pastel also on top of it and at first um i thought it was female so i had it as my whole back and after it grew in a couple of weeks um it was a male so i had it i had it for sale um got it you know and, and i know why it's it hasn't sold man i have it priced pretty high okay um, and that's one of those things like i'm not gonna die to me that's a beautiful animal you know you've seen it yeah yeah um, yeah i've compared it and you know not just because it's my animal but maybe because it is my animal <laughs> i compared <laughs> it to other toxics that are out there and okay i like it a lot more um it's okay. just clean so i think it's worth what i priced it at um nice We'll see. I mean, um, you know, there's a couple of shows that are coming up that I'm going to be doing that, you know, somebody might pick it up and um, I'll be I'll be happy to see who picks it up and, you know, see what they do with it, which that animal well, the 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 male and that pairing that I created that animal this year, I put to my stable female. So I'm doing triple heads um, for Sable, Azantic and Toffee Belly. Um, to hopefully in the next, you know, future breeding, create some acid grains, what it's called. Okay. And it's beautiful snakes, man. Um, I've only Bro, seen your, the hog nose combo names might be worse than the ball pythons. <laughs> I, have, I have no clue. Like, yeah, man. Dude, I have no clue. So, and some of the ball python ones, I'm just like, what? I'm like, I hear a new, a new like name given to a combo every day. Mm. And I'm just like, why? It just doesn't yeah. make sense. Yeah, they're out there, man. And and <laughs> you know it's crazy. Some of the some of the the nicknames for the for the combos, um, I'm not a fan of. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll just call the you know call the what genetics they are out. just yeah. yeah just the genes. Got gotcha. yeah 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 I'm for some of that stuff. Um, but then some like the the coral stuff. It's coral core because it's they're hot pink snakes. You know, pink yep. and white. Yeah, and no stuff. that that one makes sense for that sure. That makes sense. Um. But you know that, that's a good that's a good topic there, bro. Like naming a combo that you produce. Oh, you bro, know? you gotta yeah. I mean, <laughs> you gotta hear MJ, MJ's rants when uh, we're talking about new new ball python more or new ball python morphs. Uh, yeah. It's funny, but yeah. Um, I also wanted to talk about like I wanted to give people's perspective. And by the way, guys. What's up? Don't be shy in the chat. There's like 30 of you here and no one's talking. What's up with that? But I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're watching. Uh, and if you're just tuning in, thank you. Uh, it's the third segment of Thank God It's Colubrids. Hit that like, hit that, hit that subscribe, and uh, keep watching. Yeah, drop um, a super chat. Drop a super chat if, if you want to, if you got a topic you want to talk about. Um, I kind of wanted to give people a perspective uh, and it's definitely good from you of what it's like on the day to day of a colubrid breeder, because there's a bit more. I don't want to say there's more that goes into it than with other species, but there's obviously things that we have to do. Like we deal with faster metabolism. We deal with brumation. So can you kind of give it, especially in the position you're in, because you are now doing this full time and you could feel free to talk about that. Um like, can you give the perspective of what it's like on a day to day for you and just overall as a as a yeah. hog nose breeder? Yeah, man. Um, you know, this is coming into like this year, still having hatchlings from last year, produce starting pairing and all that stuff. It's really coming and hitting like the full circle and the workload that it takes to um, you know, do this full time and have the quantity of animals that it, um even even I mean compared to some people I have a small collection right um yeah but being my second year and just trying to figure out my uh you know my process and having still hatchlings producing more and stuff like that last year was a lot easier because it was just starting pairing and produce and hatching and then taking care of the hatchlings stuff right like now I'm doing both at the same time you know shows and I'm I'm getting into stuff. your I'm getting into that same habit because i still have animals here from from last year as well i i definitely didn't uh i don't want to say not have success i sold a few but like i'm still holding on to 23s that i have for sale so mm -hmm. yeah i'm getting into that that recycle uh now i'll have new hatchlings on top of everything yeah it's it's actually um it's a little nerve-wracking man 
yeah. trying to to now like thinking about that, like I'll say, I've been thinking about lately on um how I'm gonna juggle 2023 babies, new babies coming in, and then after the fact taking care of the especially the females after laying and stuff. Yeah. Um, but you know, just a day to day basis nowadays, it's um Mondays I uh feed babies, um, I do spot cleans, you know, and then um Wednesday I'll feed adults and spot clean and then uh, either Thursday or Friday I'll feed babies again more cleaning you know um and it's it's just a rinse and repeat cycle So you you do the two meals a week for your your for newer the, babies Yeah for, yeah, for the okay. new babies um okay. you know and, and How long are you doing that for you're you're like still doing that for 23s Yeah I'm still doing that for 23s Okay um there's some stuff that's like you know like up in this area here that were born, you know, the first round, the first set of cultures gotcha. that are still left over where now they're, you know, sized up a little bit on, on the mice okay. um, size. So I'm drawing them down to a week, but the stuff that's on lower levels, they're still two times a week. Cause they're taking smaller, uh, meal steel still. Um, gotcha. So, you yeah. Know, I think, you know what, I think it's a different perspective cause you're just dealing with such smaller animals in comparison. And I haven't dealt with a, a small, small species yet as babies. So mm -hmm. um, Texas rats hatch out at a decent size. And the way I've always felt, and I know I'll have to change this uh, when I start hatching different species. Um, I always like, I'm very good at giving an eye test when it comes to meal size. And I'm, I'm about giving one slightly larger meal than multiple tiny meals. Mm. Um, so as soon as I feel that I can bump up to that next food size, I will. Uh, like I have my my twenty threes from last year, the Texas rats. Like besides one that came as a runt from a du a double clutch, and it was the only good egg. Mm -hmm. So the the first clutch, like they're all on hoppers, and they've been on hoppers for like a couple months. Yeah, um, yeah like and they're it, just, know, they've grown super well. They they're yeah. big. They're big animals, and you'd be surprised to know that they're 23s, Three. and they hatched yeah. in, like, uh, I think it was June or something. So, yeah. yeah. And, and to talk about that, like, hoppers, and this is a good um, comparison onto, like, hog nose hatchlings to adults. Like, my adult males are eating hoppers at full size. Right, right. You know, so, like, to think about that, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy. So, like, yeah, so that smaller meals – definitely going to have, you know, more, you know, cleaning and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Especially I'm a freaking man. I'm a neat freak. Um, and you know, I have I know an air purifier are. here. I have, you yeah. know, and look, honestly, like my collection is not that big that sometimes I clean just to clean. Um, you know, and I think, uh, to me, I've said it before. That's, I think another part of my success where I haven't had any like sick animals and stuff like that, where, right. Cleanliness, I think, is the first, first, uh, you know, line of defense for any kind of sickness and stuff like that. Hundred you know? percent. Yeah, yeah, guys, do your do your spot cleans, do your water, your regular water changes. Like that stuff is all very important. However, I also am on the agreement that like too clean, like you keep too sterile. That's also probably not the best thing as well. Like if you're like doing sterile paper towels all day long, like yeah. Yeah. It's it's not the best because you're like you're basically doing what we did in COVID, which is like stay inside. And then you when you go outside again, you immediately get sick because your immune system doesn't know how to fight anything. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want to say like leave shit in your snakes enclosures, but like it is. Yeah, but like it's good for them to be exposed and not be sterile. You yeah. know, that's what I, I and I've tried the paper towels. Um, and that's a fucking mission, man. I hate it. I, I, yeah. I would never even look, um, I, I quarantine no matter what I get. I quarantine. Um, I have a small, like makeshift rack in another room and I quarantine and I first started quarantine on paper towels, but it's a everyday thing to go. You have to change that stuff. And yep. I don't want to be touching my quarantine animals every single day. So yeah, they're, they're, they're on uh, Aspen and stuff like that. Um, you know. okay. So, gotcha. you know, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I mean, I personally wouldn't recommend paper towels. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Just not, not for the colubrids, maybe yeah. for like, for like 
you know, ball pythons, leopard geckos, crested geckos. Like, yeah, paper towel is cool, like yeah. for all that stuff. But especially with the colubrids are moving around a little bit more, they're gonna mess up that paper towel. Their metabolism so fast, you're gonna be changing that stuff every couple days. So mm. it is what it is. Um, something also about like almost like responsibility of keeping we were kind of like getting into it uh you know just how many babies we're actually probably gonna have along with our stuff from last year is like you have to really be aware if you're gonna breed like how much food you need on hand and how much money you're gonna actually spend on food so like i did i did the math and if i had and I, I said it in the V unit chat last night. So if I per se, and I'm gonna have more than this, if I have 10 Texas rat hatchlings and I keep them, uh, whatever, even for like the first month or so, um, and I feed every five days on, on new hatchlings, at least for the first couple months, I feed every five days. That's uh, so that's 10 pinkies per feeding, and then times six in the month because five times, uh, mm -hmm. or 30 divided by five is six. Um, so dude, that's 60 pinkies in a month. Like that's a lot of pinkies. And then two months is 120. And then it's like, have you sold any yet? And if you haven't, those numbers are still adding up. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, that, that's very important. You know I mean? Like we're, we're talking about it. We have 2023 babies still, right? Um, yeah. And we got to feed our regular collection. We got to feed that stuff. Um, our holdbacks, we got to feed, you know, I got, I think 40 eggs right now in the incubator already, I don't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, so that already, yeah, that's, that's about half this rack that's behind me, you know, the hatchet yeah. rack filled up. Um, and, and, and it adds up, man. The other day I was, I was looking at last year's, um, expenses and stuff like that. And I spent a lot of money on, uh, mice because you know what, even, even like, brand new hatchlings we're feeding day olds um there's right. not a big difference between day olds and regular pinkies and like yep. peach fuzzies um it, it's still a big big uh, big expense um, oh yeah you're talking about price difference yeah, yeah. no it's there, not. There's not yeah there's not a big difference so like you know and like you said you're feeding two times a week you know and like you said 120 you know pinkies in two weeks right you said 120 in two months if we're talking two about months, 10 yeah. hatchlings yeah if we're talking about 10 hatchlings that's 120 yeah. in two months like that's crazy to think about and in my i'm of the opinion that like as long as you could like if the snake's a good size and like has had six to eight really strong meals i do think that animal is ready for a new home i, I or i i would say like six six to eight weeks six to eight weeks of strong feeding um, if you're feeding every seven days, sometimes that's, you know, six to eight meals, but I like to feed every five on new hatchlings. Um, but yeah, so, and then after that two month mark, I usually go back to the seven day schedule. Cause one, like, like we said, it's very expensive. And two, I'm probably getting close to like ramping up the size, excuse mm -hmm. me, of the prey item. Yeah. At and least on the species I'm keeping. Yeah. And you know what's the thing, man? I noticed that um my stuff that I'm holding back and that I got this year, and even my 2022 pickups that I got, um, I've slowed down, not slowed down. Um, I've done like the seven day or maybe like 10 day feedings. Um, they're still growing good and stuff like that, but I'm not seeing like a big, big like growth spurt. Um, and I actually like it. Um, I feel like the, the okay. animals are taking a little more time to mature and, and just grow, yeah. you know, within time. Um, and bro, they're hungry every time I open a tub. So yeah. Um, yeah. That, that makes me happy, you know, when they're coming yep. out hungry and it's easy to feed. Because that's the only thing. Trying to feed, pro you know, trying to go down the rack with problem feeders, you're going to spend a lot of time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, um... I'm not dealing with any, so I'm also of the opinion when it comes to feeding and, and problem feeders and whatnot, uh, especially with colubrids that are very small, delicate animals as hatchlings, if you're not going to eat, you're not going to eat. I'm going to leave that pinky in there for you and you're going to take it or you're not going to take it. Uh, I was mentioning before, so that 
te- clutch of Texas rats, that female actually self, you know, produced a uh, second clutch off of retained sperm. And I only got one good egg out of that. And that egg that hatched, um, it was a very small female and she did not eat for the first two months would not take a thing so i was like man i'm gonna lose her i'm gonna lose her this and that all of a sudden one day she decided to take i'm like okay guess you're good and she's taken every week since so now uh you know there's there's no problem there um but yeah i've seen it at the pet store job you know we've had corn snakes hatch and i i've seen it go months on end it took that snake months to die because it just would not eat and it's sad and it sucks but it's the reality and i'm i i don't necessarily want to be that guy to force feed um you know i i i get it sometimes with like the ball pythons and we're talking about like very high dollar animals and you're just like, Oh shit. Like I really want this animal to survive. Yeah. Uh, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to make it about the money, but you know, I saving, trying to like stress this animal out to save its life potentially. And I might not even do that. I don't find it to be worth it. If that animal wasn't meant to eat, I'm not sure it was, it was really, meant to be here in the first place Mm -hmm. and it sucks but that that happens you know we're dealing with nature 100 percent. i mean um i shared on like i shared with you guys um i had a female second or third female delay this year um not everything's success either man um she had was it late i think 12 eggs one good egg we had one good egg out of 12 you know and it's part you know it's first time female uh, first time male. So who knows if it's the female, if it's the male or is, you know, the first, first year female. Did you put just... that male with others? Um, no, the only female, oh, okay. um, you know, okay. so what I'm going to do actually this year, I'm going to, uh, feed her back up and I'm going to pair her up with another lavender male, gotcha. um, to see if it, it was the male, you know, luckily yep, I have yep. a, a backup, you know? Um, yeah. So hopefully, you know, that, that works out and I get a better second clutch. And and even then you, you could chalk it up to it being her first year. Like mm-hmm. you still can't even, I wouldn't necessarily place the blame as long as she's still healthy. I would, I would give it a shot next year again. Oh, for sure. Yeah, man. Like this year, the females that, uh, laid last year, um, that's another thing too, talking about feeding, right? Um, uh, my females are generally small, uh, lighter in weight this year. Still good, healthy weight and stuff like that, but just generally lighter, not as much as fat reserve. I already think, you know, because a lot lot of last year I had was their first breeding season. So they had all that, you know, weight from their, you know, from hatchling to their, you know, first breeding season. And I think this year they're at like their natural, I think it's probably going to be their normal adult size uh, weight, but I'm producing more eggs. They've produced more eggs out of this, uh, the females at a lower weight. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And people across other things have talked about that, like here on Trap Talk, like um, I know people like Nick Mudden has talked about, you know, like having these more slender animals. And I think he was talking more so a- about pythons and correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was carpets, but like like and maybe some other stuff. But like you you prefer that slimmer male like a like a smaller male and and a slimmer female and even with the chondros like some of those guys were saying like like they have really small females and other people are just like what the hell so it it, it's really interesting to think about you know how we're feeding them i overweight is not the answer overfeeding is definitely not the answer i think growing up i think you could feed these animals aggressively and keep them slim but also grow them fast Mm -hmm. uh like what i'm doing with the rats like they are so slim, but they're just growing. They're beefy. They're putting on size, but they're in, uh, by no means fat. Um, once they get older, you kind of slow down on that. And, yeah. um, you know, the size kind of catches up to them and, and then it's all good. But yeah, overweight is not the answer and underweight surely isn't either, but healthy medium and you're good. Plus your females now have another year like of life under their belt. So, yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, that, that's, that, that was very interesting this year. And like you said, another year, another, you know, already, uh, you know, more mature reproductive systems and stuff like that. I think that always uh, helps out. Um, what's it called? And then, um, you know, Blake, we have, you know, he's one of the, the sponsors. Yeah. And stuff. Like, you know, um, I started feeding quail uh, earlier this year from him. Um, and I have some females and males that love it. And there's some, there's less that don't eat it than what I that actually do eat it. Um, and I think that's helped out too with the slenderness of, you know, being able to produce and um, we just have a good, good uh, nutrition in the females' bodies. Just a different variety. Yeah. Um, because that's another thing too. I, one thing I was thinking is like, all right, if they were underweight and under, you know, nutrition values, they wouldn't even be, be able to produce as much healthy eggs as they would. Yeah, either, either the same amount and just less fertile ones or yeah, just less eggs in general. So mm -hmm. yeah, you're definitely doing something right to keep that up. And I get to see this here. And again, it could be chalked up to age, but I I've been feeding a lot of quail here, like more quail, like since brumation, I started getting the quail before uh, I got it during brumation. So, um, I was like, okay, I'll feed my animals as soon as they come out. And all my animals, uh, you know, used to be um, on rats. I was feeding them rats, and I switched them over to quail. So I'm interested to see if the quail played an effect, but I'm not really sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's like, right. And I think that's one of the cool thing about the colubrid world um, is that they are generally – newer to the pet trade especially um and and you know in the in the reptile world with like in majority where we're still trying to figure out different variety diets still trying to you know dial in different species and stuff like that yeah you know it's, yeah even hognose i mean we're still within the hognose community it's very very young you know being able to start and produce different um Morse and all that other stuff and keeping them right uh dennis i just want to address that comment because i think you're just taking what i'm saying what or what i said out of context because what what i essentially meant is that there are animals in the wild that will fail to thrive as hatchlings and obviously ones that will die uh that's part of the reason why these animals produce so many eggs especially hognose um they like they have an instinct to produce that many eggs because they're trying to get every single one to survive or the most mm -hmm. possible. Um, so obviously, yes, I, I fully am with you that rack systems are not nature, and uh, you know, there are better things we can do as keepers sometimes. And I definitely look towards setting up cages for certain species of mine, uh, in the future, but that's all I meant by that comment yeah. that it's nature because it, it that happens uh yeah. in nature so yeah. and and i, I got a, actually a good good uh story on that about you know the rack system and stuff like that um and i'm speaking on western hognose right um so this year um i switched all my females and all my whole backs males everything that's my collection not you know stuff that's for sale um to coco core and sand mix um, trying That's to the just full substrate. Yeah, yeah, the full okay. substrate. Just trying to give it a little more of a naturalistic feeling and stuff like that. You know, they're yeah. not bioactive or any of that stuff. I still yeah. got to fucking you know spot clean and full cleans yeah. every you know at least every three four weeks. Um, but I have seen different behaviors, different um, ways that the 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 hog nose are enjoying that type of uh, substrate, and. Um, I made a mistake. I said, okay, they're able to burrow in this. And um, since it's a sand and cocoa mix, especially when it's moist, it holds burrows very well. Um, I wasn't going to put a uh, lay box in. Um, and what's it called? And I had a female laying. And one of my other friends, um, we were doing this together. You know, he, he, he was doing the same thing. And uh, I get a message Saturday morning. Hey man, put lay boxes in it. They're eating their eggs. Um, oh, and damn. as soon as like he said that, I got up and I checked, and one of the female was had just finished laying, 
and she had an egg in her mouth. Oh no. Um, so right there and then I went and I had luckily I had my lay boxes ready just in case I pull all the lay boxes in. Now, talking about space, rack systems, stuff like that. The first thing these females did go into the lay bin. Yep. Um, and 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 even before they're ready, like I'll leave them in there sometimes. Like last year, I left them for the whole year, even after they're done laying. Oh Most yeah. Time, oh yeah. I find it hide. I think it's great. Yeah, I, I, I think it's there. great. I've been loving implementing that uh, as part of my system. And funny thing about that is, I, you know, I've been seeing all my females in and out of their lay boxes, at, even as humid hides, e even the males as well. I've been mm -hmm. finding all the animals in there. Mm -hmm. The female that laid decided not to use the lay box. I'm just like, yeah. what the hell? Come on. I gave you a nice yeah. moist sphagnum moss, all, all this, and yeah. you just decided to lay. And she cleared out a space of... <laughs> uh the the substrate in there the the cocoa so she just laid like straight up on the bare tub floor and i'm just like are you serious so yeah. then i had to be careful about pulling them off but they didn't get stuck because i caught them very early so it was all good and she laid a a nice clutch so that that's nice. all that matters yeah man but you know that that racked my brain because the substrate that's in the lay box it's now it's the full bin but they still prefer okay. to go into lay box. Interesting. Um, you know, so I was like, come on, guys. It's like you have all that space. Um, but then the egg thing too, um, was now I think it, they're being they're laying their eggs in the wide open. Um, so they feel I think threatened and they're gonna eat their eggs. Um, that's a lot of times with hognose. Yeah, that's that. really that's really interesting. I don't I don't hear that as much with the species I keep. Mm -hmm. Um I just make sure like because there are some times where you're just, I don't know, where you could be a little ignorant to your animals being super gravid and like you have a male in there still. Like that's mm -hmm. what I would be careful of it, is a male going to eat eggs as if he's like uh, mm -hmm. nest raiding um, and thinks it's some other species that isn't, you know, his own children. Uh, I, I've had this happen before. There was in a the Texas waterfall? rat. Yeah, back like one of those early clutches, she laid an egg in the water bowl uh, in 2017 or 2019, and I was pissed, man. I was so mad. I was just like, of all places, you went straight. Like, yeah, so I'm worried about that. That's something I'm very anal about as well is, hey, don't lay in the water bowl. That's why I go crazy checking um their tubs when i know it's close to laying time because i'm like yeah. don't you dare lay in that water bowl because yeah. i give them a nice size water bowl because i want them to be able to soak in there um so yeah I, i'm just like yeah. please don't that's not an interesting part too at, right after laying how they like to soak in the water bowls have you oh seen yeah that? that's that, yeah, that's yeah. really cool see that yeah they're they're just trying to chill man they're doing everything like they're getting rehydrated also they're probably drinking while they're mm -hmm. in there so uh there there's a lot of different factors besides just like overall relaxing plus they're getting hydrated like that takes the laying eggs takes so much energy uh out of them so they're definitely drinking water like they want that meal uh, I always recommend the first meal after laying is a, a smaller meal just because they don't mm -hmm. have a lot of energy. It's just give them a smaller meal to get started. And if you want to go straight back to the regular stuff, I still want to recommend it, but like you probably can, but start at least with one smaller meal to get some energy back. But yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. And last year, um, this year I haven't had to do it yet. Um, but last year I had, two females i think that like almost took like uh, you know close to 24 hours to lay and i fed like intermediate after like i saw that they were like getting tired and stuff that i fed and while they were they still laying while they're laying and Bro, um, hogs are crazy <laughs> and 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 um and i actually helped um get the rest of the eggs out it felt like i think they got an extra energy boost because like i was telling you before um i had a female that I was just, I just came back from a, a small little getaway with the family a couple of days. Uh, but it took 24 hours for the female to finish laying. Um, you know, 24 hours is a long time for them to start, you know, be pushing. So yeah. if I was here, unfortunately, I wasn't here. If I was here, um, if because she started laying around, like, I think around like 10 o'clock Tuesday morning, 
if by like midnight that night, if I was still here and she was still laying, I would have fed her. Um, I didn't get to feed her because I wasn't here. Um, but I, I've had it and I've had good success and it seems like it, it works, man. It, it gets them, um, you know, energized and get moving again, uh, but they'll eat, you know. I could be totally wrong. I could swear some point last year there was a picture of, I think it was a tricolor hog eating out of, while it was still in the egg. Maybe it was a Western. I wouldn't be surprised, yeah, I, man. It was, it was a snake that was still in the egg. Had It's, head halfway out and took a pinky off tongs from someone i was just like damn yeah. that's crazy yeah man i mean even you know it's crazy like the size right you would think these animals would be bigger with their hunger um because some some of these especially the females yeah all year round they, they love to eat um right now you know producing the eggs they love to eat um so that's that's another little uh you know little tip here and there that if you have a female you know hog nose again I mean, you guys can try it with other females if it's taking a long time to lay. You know, give her a small meal. Like you said, small meal. Like, generally, I feed my females off of breeding season um, small mice, small adult mice already. Um, and then during breeding season, I feed them poppers more frequent. Okay. Um, so, you know, depends on the female size and if she's laying. And I'm going to give her – sometimes I'll give her like a um, – what's it called? A fuzzy – or maybe a smaller size hopper. Just oh, so you'll not, go that small. Okay. Yeah, just so it's not such a big meal. And yeah. she still can get, you know, some kind of a nutrient gotcha. or, you know, you know, I, I don't know if it's just maybe her passing the, the meal that helps push the eggs out. Gotcha. But it's worked for me. And um, because they get tired, man. Especially, you know, like that female I was telling you, 17 eggs. You know, that, that's yeah. a lot for a small animal. 100%. Yeah. Um but yeah. Uh what what else you got, man? <clears throat> Sorry. Man. What else is yeah. what what's going on over there? Cuz I know you still have a lot of stuff cooking in yeah. terms of clutches and whatnot. So, what's this season looking like? Um So so far 12 females already, you know, in full action breeding locks. I saw that another thing about the new substrate, um, it's I saw it locks a lot quicker this year. Um, Interesting. Um, I saw a lot better behavior. Um, one cool thing that I I, I did, man, um, and this is me being the mad scientist and you know doing different things is um, what do we say? You know, when it's when it's raining, the the pressure drops, the stuff of that it's good for yeah. the weather, right? Yeah. Um, so with the cocoa core, I actually missed. The hog nose. Okay. Um, so I'll go and I'll miss and stuff like that. And usually I'll do it um, late in the afternoon, almost at nighttime. And a lot of times I've seen, especially when I'll put the mail back in, I'll miss and I'll see a lot more breeding activity right after misting. Gotcha. Um, and then it's another cool thing. is like seeing them drink water, having a perfectly good fresh water bowl there for like a day or two. Yeah. Not touch it. Once I spray them. They'll start drinking off the sides of the the tub. Right. They'll start drinking yeah. off the oils and stuff. And I was like, "Come on, guys, it, yeah, you know." Yeah. Um, but that 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 extra breeding behavior was really cool to see after um, what's it called? After misting and stuff. Um, I don't know if it was coincidence or what it is, but I think that does that has helped this year. Um, and you know, back to like you know nature or trying to you know try to be a little more naturalistic. And what yeah. we keep. Um, so yeah, so 12 females. Um, I saw locks, at least one lock every female with the males. Um, I already had what was it one, two, three, three, no, four females lay. Um, three really good sets of clutches. You know, one was a you know miss, and then I'm waiting, had a couple uh while I was gone, I had two more prelay sheds, and then I think about another like nice. four are in prelay shed right now um so man i, I think if I, I was i was looking at my average last year was about 12 eggs in overall for female so 12 eggs out of 12 females you know on average it's a lot of babies this year yeah yeah you know at, at um, least 30 more than what you got last year correct yeah man yeah so looking forward to that 
a little anxious, you know, trying to take care of all those babies and maintain them. Um, but I also have already shows lined up. So like nice. In, was it two weeks, two, three weeks? We have uh going to Dallas and RBC Dallas now, you know, what used to be NRBC Arlington, now they moved to Dallas. So April 12th, uh April 12th is VIP from two to seven while vendors are setting up. And I think uh early open, I think if I'm not wrong, nine for VIP as well for both days, Saturday and Sunday. So we'll we're making the trek out there. Be our first nice. um long distance out of state. Well, out of state um pending. So we yeah. got that going on. Hopefully, you know, be cool to meet different whole totally different people, you know, um try to make different customer uh, connections and all that stuff. Uh, I think shows are very important for especially people like us that are just getting our, our animals and our name out, you know, yeah. um, more of market and online sales can just do so much for us. You know, I think the, the interaction actually showing the, our animals, uh, person face to face is very important. So I got that going on. Um, I got, what's it called? Uh, Daytona already booked. So nice. I'll be in Daytona. I forgot my tables, but I'll be in the main room. Uh, I'm really lucky to get my first year being Daytona nice. and be in the main room. Uh, Dude, I'm um, so excited for Daytona. Yeah, One, right. the amount of colubrid friends I've I've made that go and vend. Um yeah. it's just gonna be awesome. And to think last year that I just straight up didn't know all of those people mm -hmm. and like I walked by them at the show probably just kind of sucks, but it's awesome as you grow into this hobby and you get to meet new people and you get to have experiences like that. So, uh, guys, essentially what Alvaro is saying, make sure you go check them out in Dallas if you're going. And mm -hmm. definitely you will catch both of us in Daytona. I will not be vending, but I will absolutely be in attendance. So, yeah, yeah man. Um, you know, through, you know, the Kaluber Corruption, your podcast, man, I'll be, I think I'm vending right next to Billy if I'm not wrong. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. You know, so yeah. that's that's another cool thing, right? Like already somebody that's within our circle uh, vending next to them and stuff like yep. that. Um, one thing I'll tell you guys, it's vending. It's a hell of a job to do. Um, yeah, especially busy shows. Um, you know, if now I'm speaking from my experience, when I vend, I'm in that like mode of Alvaro's in go mode. Yeah, There's trying no to casualness. No, once we all. get there, <laughs> yeah, He's in go mode. Yeah, I'll talk to my friends after. Um, you know, I, I want to make as many connections with you know the 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 patrons and stuff like that coming on into the show uh i want to make yeah. an impression um i take my display setup and my you know cleanliness at the show is very serious um you know and luckily i have help man i have my wife comes out she helps out uh for a lot of the bigger shows uh my daughter too my oldest um even my little one she's out there pulling snakes out and talking to yeah. people so it's a whole family affair um you know and same thing for the, uh, Dallas, where the whole family's going out to Dallas. And we're going to, you know, go uh, hopefully make some good connections out there and make meet uh, new people. Um, you know, the I think the coolest things about those big shows are the, what's it called? The auctions after Saturday night. Yeah. That's when I think I, I, you know, a lot of the, you know, friendships and like, you know, getting to know other vendors and stuff like that really happens for me. Yeah, and the the community side of things really comes out. Yeah, man, it's really cool. Uh, my eldest daughter sometimes is a little cringy, especially like Daytona or any of that stuff. You know, we've all you know if you've been to one of those uh, auctions, US Arc auctions, um, there's some questionable stuff that gets auctioned off there. Uh, <laughs> you know, especially for my 13 year old daughter. So um, yeah, but um, she's a you know like she loves going to auctions. You know, okay. seeing stuff like that, like Daytona this past year, you know, like I said, I had my family. I was out there uh, helping vent uh, our friend Exotic Fire Hogs. Yeah. Um, and my daughter, it was me and my daughter closed out the auction. My, other, my wife and my youngest went back to the hotel room and, um, you know, went to sleep and stuff like that. Yeah. But that's really cool. So vending is, is really cool. Um, I've done a lot of Repticons and um, that's another cool thing. You know, don't just strive for the big shows. Get a couple of the local shows under your belt um, and, and figure out yeah, yeah. that that uh, yeah. setup you have and all that stuff. 
Yeah. Plus start, start meeting people in your area. And, and once you get out there, you get to expand to different groups of people and you go a little bit farther and you, you know, you just get to show your snakes off to different people. So, yeah. um, I've had unsuc I I've vended shows and with my limited stock, I've had unsuccessful shows. I've sold a couple animals that I wanted to sell at shows. So it is what it is. Um, but shows are awesome. And I think it's a great way for you to exemplify your passion in person to people. And yeah. uh, in my opinion, if you don't show off your passion, then what gives anyone the reason to want to be passionate about one of your animals? 100%. Um, treat everybody that comes to the table as they're going to spend a million dollars at your table. Yeah. You know? um, no matter who it is, if it's a, you know, a, a, a a 10 year old, you know, trying to look for his first normal Western hog nose or, you know, yep. rat snake and stuff like that. You got to treat them as they could be the biggest, the next biggest breeder or, you know, uh reptile keeper there is in, in, in the community. So, yeah. you know, I always, always do that. Another good thing. Another uh, tip about shows, find comfortable shoes <laughs> because man, standing two days in a row for, I would say, I mean, the shows usually what, run about 10 hours, something like that, a day. Um, depends. Depends. But, like, you know, you're standing and, and then sh set up, cleaning and all that stuff. Easily a 12-hour day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And then one thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to shows is just, you know, what we've been overall noticing at shows. Um, you know, like, we hope to see this Kaluber resurgence because, you know, Everyone talks about it. These shows are so ball python gecko heavy that it's like, man, you just you just want to see more stuff. Like I get it so excited when I'm able to walk up to a table and and see even corn snakes, see hog nose. I'm just like, oh, it, it's something different. I'm like, that's cool. I get to look at. I mean, there's turtles at every show here in Florida, but like, it's just the point that seeing the variety is like a breath of fresh air. So that's what I'm here to do is show more species that you just don't see at everyone's table. Cause the stuff I'm keeping, I don't see at people's tables. So yeah. Sure, man. And this, this is one crazy thing that I heard multiple shows, even the local smaller shows, um, especially the smaller shows. Um, was that I have the most Western hog nose on my table or some of the prettiest. And for me, my first year, that was a crazy to hear. You know, um, yeah. I, I would have thought that there would have been more before I started doing the shows. Um, and man, I'm probably going to do local shows for my whole uh, career. Um, you know, I think yeah. that's a, a great um you know, getting, like I said, getting out in front of the community and stuff like that. And another thing too, is I'm going to produce the pet, uh, price, pet quality stuff. Um, everything's quality. It's just different price tags, you know? Um, yeah. so I, I'm, I, I started with a pet, you know, one, one hog nose, um, you know, I, it's crazy. I paid and I'll tell you how, how much I paid for my Western hog nose. I paid 75 bucks for my first Western hog nose. And that's, yeah. Insane. You don't even it's see not, that anymore, right? Because no. they're like 150 at 150 the minimum. 150 with no heads, no yep. nothing. 150 minimum, you know. Um, so I, I think the the pet thing is it's a must, at least for me. Yeah. Um, you know, do you agree on that? What are your thoughts? I I agree for sure because I think uh that pet keepers are a much more important part of the hobby than some breeders like can kind of see the scope of because mm. you know we you know there are all those breeders and whatever the number is on morph market right now but just think about how many people out there are out there in this country that have one or two or maybe even five pet mm. snakes and they're just like yeah cool i just want to keep a couple snakes yeah. and and do whatever you know mm. you go into certain facebook groups and you have the you have the bioactive people and the, you know, big enclosure people that just want to make some decked out enclosures for their pets. And it's like, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, the pet keepers, you know, while there's, you know, whatever is always social media drama with 
whoever. But um, yeah, you know, everyone's important. And the more we're able to have stuff to appeal to pet people, the more people will be able to get into this hobby in general. And that's what it's all about. The day I'm able to say I was the reason someone got into reptiles, I'll be so freaking happy. I'll be so happy. Yeah, and I can't wait to sell someone their first snake. I, you know, all, all those things. And, and to even like, you know, be that guy that like blesses someone's collection uh because other people have done the same to me so like just okay. just passing stuff along um i i think goes a super super long way i agree man like and i want to say thank you for everybody just sitting here you know um joining us and stuff like that Facts. you know and any you know any of my customers are here and you know people that support just clovers reptiles and, and us man it's 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 insane to think about it um you know really we're you know we're at within a year, at least for myself, within a year of producing hog nose. Um, I've sold a, a good amount of hog nose to, you know, 13, 14, some teenagers, or even some adults that are, you know, that are just getting into uh, the reptile world. It's pretty yeah. cool. And then I've given some really cool deals on some really great deals on like, you know, a 10, 11 year old little girl and stuff like that. And I say little girls because I have daughters. And that hits home, you know, when like, yeah, I see, you know, um, a little girl that wants a hog nose and might be out of price range. I've done the deals. I've cut the price down in half because I know it's just going to be their little pet, you know, for, yeah. for them and stuff like that. Um, so I have nice. no problem doing that. Um, and then look, man, I'm a guy, I'm a man in, in, in the reptile world, but I'm a huge supporter for females in the western in, in the in the reptile world because i have my two daughters that are coming yep. up in the reptile world and i want to be able to let them have you know those female role models and stuff like that within that so yeah. I'm, I'm always you know supporting female uh you know reptile uh you know keepers breeders um yep. i had adeline on on my uh podcast and stuff like that because she kills it with the the art man yeah you know? for sure so, yeah. so it is really cool um, to be able to, you know, be able to be that first uh, reptile in somebody's home and heart, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, before, I don't know how much longer we want to go, but like before we even wrap up and we'll keep talking, but guys, if you have any questions for me and Alvaro stuff, you don't, uh, for anyone who doesn't really know us and is not familiar yeah. with us and there's stuff you want to know, feel free to throw it in there while we keep talking and we'll kind of take questions as we go. Yeah. Um, any, any, even like, you know, any specific breeding question and stuff like that about, you know, for me about Western hog nose for him, um, you know, rat snakes and stuff like that. Um, I had a question for you, man. And this is interesting yeah. because you started colubrids and then you added ball pythons to your, your, your collection. Yeah. But you're back in the main focus of colubrids and stuff like that, man. Um, yeah. What, what what was that that change for you? What was that, you know, adding the ball python? Like, how was that for you? So, I mean, it would be unfair if I wasn't honest and said I, I partially fell into, you know, I saw, like, how crazy the ball python market was booming i don't want to call myself one of those covid breeders because I, I think that's a stupid term because i've been into reptiles for ever and i've been keeping snakes consistently for the last okay. 13 years so um i think that's stupid but uh, i definitely saw the potential of ball pythons and i really fell in love with some of the mutations so i was like dude i want to get into this like i want to make some just cool ass snakes because these snakes were cool to me um but as i've gone on you know, and now, especially since starting my podcast, uh, I just, you know, I, I've been finding a lot more interest in my colubrids and in speaking with like minded people um, who are also passionate in the same ways as I am. It's just really eye opening, like just how awesome one these animals are and the community is but also i i just uh i have a hard time relating to a good portion of ball python keepers and i hate to say that but there's a lot of fakeness on that side of the industry there's a lot of shit 
that I just see on social media that I don't necessarily like. And I'm just like, it really turns me off. And it's hard to like, I find it hard not to unfollow people on Instagram sometimes just because I, I don't like the way they carry themselves, but I, I, mm-hmm keep it to be cordial and i don't like to be a controversial person but uh yeah that's just how i feel like i'm really just passionate about these animals and like when i when i'm able to see a level of oh you don't really care this is like some sort of fake shit like i i just want everything to be legit you know no i get it man um you know and that's one thing like when i first hit um you know getting really deep into the reptile world um and i had some people warn me about the drama the you know the misleading and stuff of that i love them following people too much (laughs) (laughs) you know um luckily man i've been lucky enough to steer away from that um yeah I, and I try to too. Like I just yeah. don't. As, I just don't really associate myself yeah. with that. But like just saying where I'm coming from, and, and I just really think where the passion started, like that flame has begun to like mm-hmm. be reignited. And in keeping these spe- some of these other species that I like successfully, I'm just like it just keeps giving me that like kind of yeah. uh, encouragement to like keep going, keep pushing, and and really work with the stuff I want to work with because. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do I have to lose? Like, I just love these animals. So, yeah. yeah. You know, and I think first, I think within that world, right? Like, I think first of all, it's the sheer numbers, right? It's just the numbers, right? We're humans are humans and we're going to, you know, we're going to have our our hate and stuff like that because I don't care who you are. You've you've seen some things. You're like, damn, man, you know? Yeah. Um, But I think it's just a sheer number, right? You, you you have so many ball python breeders. You have so many people that have ball pythons, and um, Doug is going to come out. Um, it, it's just trying to navigate it and stuff like that. Um, where I think in the, at least I'm speaking the the hog nose community, and now you know, especially now coming onto your podcast and having more, um, you know, meeting more hog colubrid people and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I've been. It's been definitely open arms. Welcome with open arms, man. And I, um, I've been happy. I've been happy with that. I've been happy enough where like I let my daughters, you know, be in the world and stuff like that. If, yep. if I wasn't, I'll be a recluse. I'll just breed my animals and you know shut yeah. up and that's it, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And stuff like that. Cause I I I'm that person. I'll I'll just cut it off and let people do what they're gonna right. do. Right. Um right. Yeah. There's a couple uh questions here that man that we have a uh ivory yeah. Co. Yeah, yeah, definitely want to answer Adam's question. And I wanted to talk about this actually. So uh i don't even i I don't think i need their permission to talk about it because they're talking about it on their own show but i want to continuously as we do this give the same updates that zach and clint are giving about colubrid fest uh to the colubrid community because i i just want that to be as big and as the best it can possibly be i want to help them grow that event into something really cool so uh, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, and MJ just had on Eric Burke of the Morelia Python Radio Network. Uh, he is the head honcho of that. He was on last night on MJ's show. Uh, they have a podcast under their network called the uh, Colubrid and Colubroid Radio, in which uh, the hosts there, Zach Lofman and Clint Bartley, uh, have begun organizing um you know how the npr guys do carpet fest uh they are working on colubrid fest and it's going to be a little bit different than what carpet fest is in the fact that this is going to be essentially a kind of conference type reptile show at the same time so there's going to be a day of like sales there's going to be a day of reptile talks and like uh different I don't want to say workshops, but like there's going to be different speakers and whatnot talking about different things. I think it's great. I think it's going to be awesome. They have not announced the location yet. I would like to attend. Uh, yeah, me too. If I, whatever I can do to get there, I would like to be there. Cause I just want to be a part of that. I, I think I've been putting out a good voice in the Colubrid community. So uh, yeah, a hundred percent. I, I will, 
go and hopefully it's in a central location and not like out in Cali. Sorry, MJ. It's just like super long, expensive flight and all that. I hope it's in a kind of central location, but um, which I think it will be based on what they've been saying. But yeah. Yeah, man, I agree. I want to, I want to be part of it. I mean, if they're going to have vendors and stuff like that, I want to vend, uh, but if not, I'll just come out and support and I want to go hang out and, and see what's out there, man. I, I think that will be, I mean, just to imagine what's going to be there, you know, um, yeah. the animals, the species and stuff like that's going to be yeah. crazy. Um, so yeah. I'm really looking forward to that too as well. Uh, you know, and like you said, and a cool, and by the way, it's a colubrid only reptile show, yeah. like nothing else will be allowed. So that's going to be just really interesting to see what's out there and what people are truly working with. Cause I think there's that, you know, you see like ball Python breeders, it's like morph market, everything, but like, there are a lot of colubrid people who are just old school and don't necessarily post on morph market. You'll only see it on Facebook and there might be some people and some animals behind the scenes that you just didn't know were like really around. So yeah, yeah I think it's going to be cool. Yeah. Yeah, and see, see that one-off species of colubrids that, you know, not too many people are yeah. keeping. I think that's that's going to be the coolest part about that, um, you know. Um, I want to answer Jesse Armand's uh, yeah. question. So, brumation is not necessary for breeding. Um, you do get better uh, success rate. but well, I, I also want to it, preface that it, it yeah. depends on species, so I'm not sure yeah. what exactly we're talking about. Is he a hognose guy that you know? No, I'm not sure. No. I'm not okay. Sure. Okay. No. So Jesse, it, it depends on what species we're talking about, but um, when it comes to the colubrids that do brumate in the wild, uh, I would say it depends. It still depends what species we're talking about there, but there are some people who definitely say that you can get away with it. Mm -hmm. But in the opinion of many, brumation is a healthy, natural process. Right for these animals um, that one helps stimulate breeding and also promotes the longevity and health of these yeah. animals. So uh, I always recommend it. Yeah. It, it, just, just for the simple fact that it's a fasting period for them um, helps out, right? Like, you know, especially us in, in, in captivity, we feed a constant, you know, um, diet to them. And yep. while they're not, you know, um, you know, they're not, you know, receiving as much food. I think that that diet does help. Um, and I think it helps with, like you said, like the longevity, especially with a lot of colubrid species, double clutching and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot out of them, you know? So I think that that break does help them. Um, yeah. The, cy have, the cycle in general is, is, yeah. is very important on, yeah. on three different facets, which we're going to talk about, uh, for, a shop's question uh next yeah wow. so we, we um, have um i have we have a friend um that he is he bred he brewmated it last year um it's kevin mutant um mutants kevin baron yeah um you know reptiles now um and he didn't brewmate this year so i'm really interested in this. he has a, he has a small uh sample size but i'm still i'm interested to see what yeah. his success rate is this year and stuff like that with with permission without permission um i'm not brave enough to take to try it on my own stuff yeah <laughs> um and then personally anything that uh i hatched out last year and even um so i hatched out last year or purchased any hatchings from last year and 2022 i brewmate it um anything that i kept anything that's still for sale was you know still on food and stuff like that and they're fine and actually the stuff that I brewmated that I kept for myself is actually bigger and has grown more even after two months than the stuff that's for sale that didn't brewmate. Um, gotcha. So that's that's an interesting fact, right? Like, um, is it just because they're, you know, having to go through that harsh, uh, you know. Well, they were your holdbacks. You might have been uh, a little more biased with food to them. But, you know, uh, I wasn't. We, man. Won't, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> I really wasn't, though. Um, I, I keep a, a really good schedule with both. Um, um, but I, I did, you know, I brewmate it, yeah, both hatchings and stuff of like that. And, um, I know some people are a little worried about brewmating hatchings just because of the, the, you know, um, getting them, you know, no food for two months down to, I actually weather. did as well. I gave mine an abbreviated yeah. one. Yeah. And, and we were um, talking about like, you know, different species, right? Like yeah. different species, that different, um, temperatures and brumations and stuff like that. So it all depends. Yeah. 100 percent 
Now, with this question being we're both in Florida, how do you go about a proper cremation? And I want you to answer this one first, please, because you definitely do it the proper way. And I'm going to go about my whack ass way that I do it, but it works. Yeah. Um, so I think since for hog nose, you know, you got to think about they reach southern parts of Canada, um, you know, and, in, you know, Texas and further north of Texas, there's some areas that reach 20 degrees, you know, uh, what's it called? Ambient temperature, surface temperature. Obviously, probably in the boroughs where they're at, they're maybe hitting around like 30s, 40s, 50s and stuff like that. So I replicate 50 degrees. Um, and the way I did it is I bought a I, I went the extreme route. Um, I bought yeah. a commercial fridge, like a um, glass door commercial fridge. And um, I bring it down to 50 degrees and brewmate them for two months. Um, you know, no food, no water. Uh, I know some people. So another thing, too, is I brewmate in a cocoa core um, sand mix as well. So I do everything cocoa core sand mix now. Um, lay box, bins, and brumation, um, and incubation. Uh, so moist cocoa core and not one RI problem. Not one problem with losing weight and none of that stuff. Um, everybody, most of the both years that I brumated, um, everybody either came out exact same weight or maybe lost a gram or two. That's it in two months of no, you know, no food, no yeah. water. Um, now, what I tell people is um, make sure you're feeding your snakes up to that period and taking them off of food enough time for them to process their food. And cleared out their system, you know. So that that's the way I, I brewmate, um, and I think it, it's it's very it, it's worked very well for me. Yeah. What's up, Chris? Um, yeah. So that that's it for you. Yeah. I mean. Okay. Uh, cool. We can go through the whole process of no, it. no, no, no. Yeah. You no, know, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure you got you finished what you were yeah. saying. So. The way I have brewmated the last two years here in Florida, what I'm about to say, I, I'm i going to say I don't particularly recommend because it's definitely not the right way, but it worked last year and it's working again this year. So it's a method. Um, a, a show you're, you're here. You, you seem pretty knowledgeable. I assume you know what I'm about to say, but for everyone else, there are three main factors uh, that are important that we're looking at when it comes to uh, brumation. There's temperature cycles, or just like temperature, feeding cycles, and light cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, there's probably more that goes, there might be other little things that go into it, but those three things are very key factors when it comes to brumation. So what I do, uh, my personal keeping style, I keep my animals in my garage here in Florida. It's not insulated in any way. It stays like usually it's somewhere in the 70s. It gets as low as, uh, sorry, it gets as high as like 80 in here. Um, all my rat snakes are pretty much ambient year round. What I do because it is so warm in here, uh, I do not have the space for commercial freezer like Alvaro does. Um, I go through the same kind of brumation cycle that anyone normally would, uh, except I essentially just put them up in lock tubs in my bedroom, in my closet. That's what I've done the past two years. Um, now they, they've been in like relatively smaller tubs. Uh, they're sitting in there. I put, I put water in there and it's not that cold but it gets colder than it does down here and it's noticeably colder uh it definitely gets down into like the mid 60s overnight when it's a lot colder in the room um i had a govi kind of tracking that but what's also important about my process where my where i am lacking in my temperature drop i think i am making up for in my light and food cycles because i'm not feeding uh, you know, I, I cut that food. I obviously let them flush their system out. Um, I'm not feeding them. So, which in that case, because I'm not keeping them at a very, very low temperature, I know that their metabolism is still working a little bit, a, a little bit more than I would like it to. So I don't go the full 
two months, two and a half months that other people do. I cut it a little bit shorter than that, just because I want my animals to be good when I um, pull them out of brumation, you know? Um, and also they're in my dark closet. Uh, no light. I, I, I cut that light. The only light they get is from the window that might shine through to like the bottom of the closet. Like it's, it's the door shut. It's in that closet. So yeah, uh, that's kind of what I do. And I've been successful the last two years now with that. So, um, I'd like very much like, I like the will banks incubators that you could use the, uh, basically brumation setting. I like the idea of that. I think when I'm in my own space for anyone who doesn't know, I do still live with my parents. I'm in my parents' garage, uh, when it comes to the reptiles. So, uh, space is tight. Space is limited. It is what it is. I'm working with what I'm working with. Um, yeah, I can't say. And again, like I mentioned at the beginning of that whole thing, I can't say what I'm doing is going to work for everyone else. I can just tell you that it worked for me. But those three things that I mentioned are the important factors of yeah. brumation. I agree, guys. And um, if you guys want to take a closer look at the, the whole process, I have it documented. I have it on my YouTube channel. So go to Clover's Reptiles and um, I have a playlist of brumation um, of 2022 and 2023. Um, just going over the process, the, the equipment I use and stuff for that. And then, um, like I said, I have a big fridge, but you could downsize that same setup into like a mini fridge. If you have one or two snakes or a smaller, uh, you know, fridge and stuff like that. Um, yeah. so go ahead and take a look at that stuff. Um, you know, I, I try, I try to document every process of keeping and breeding and showing on, on my YouTube stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No problem, man. I, uh. I hope that gave some insight and I can say, um, I don't know what I'm like, what the future holds for me in terms of like where I'll be living and, and whatnot. So when I'm, you know, getting ready to breed other species and may have to brew mate, especially the Asian species, like I'm going to want to actually get them colder. Cause I know they, they have to get, uh, some of them, you know, have to brew mate a little bit. Like I have the, uh, OP Valanti, um, which do have to brumate as opposed to cocci. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll keep playing it by ear. Like I said, I'm going to keep doing what works for me. And if it works, it works. And I don't really mind. And my animals are healthy and, and all that. So that's cool. Uh, you know, kind of going off of that, it, like I very much feel that stuff with this, uh, <laughs> with the reptile hobby, it's very much on a person to person basis. And it depends on where you live. Like there's a lot of factors that go into stuff with your animals. So what works for one person may not work for the other. Uh, and sometimes it will in, in, in different parts of the country, it, there's so many things that go into it. So it's, it don't compare yourself to other people. Just, uh, you know, you can kind of take what people say, I don't want to say with a grain of salt, but like even what I just said, you could take that with a grain of salt because that might not work for you. Yeah. So you might have to do what Alvaro does and maybe what Alvaro does doesn't work for you. Although, you know, the, the kind of cool, the cooler fridge thing is like, you know, kind of the, the real the general, deal thing yeah. of what works. Yeah. 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 And like Chris said, man, uh, people in the Northeast and co colder climates that actually get down, you know, you know, thirties and stuff like that. Um, I have friends that either, you know, brewmate in bins in their, uh, basements and stuff like that. Um, you know, for you Florida yeah. people that don't know what basements are, it's like a separate floor <laughs> under your house. Um, I I'm from Jersey too. So, um, I know the cold and stuff like that. And then I have uh, friends like in Ohio that, um, brewmate basically just turn off heat in the rack and just brew yeah. the whole room and stuff like that. I've had um, people that just open a window. I've heard people like, we'll just open yeah. a window. They'll be able to like section even just one rack off and just open a window in the room. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, Chris, I, I, maybe I will, who knows? Um, oh, okay. You're on the, you're on the West coast. Awesome. Well, what up, man? Cool. Good yeah, thanks to know. For in, yeah. Um, so yeah, so there, it, it's different, you know, the good saying different ways to skin a cat. Um, you know, it, it is trying, trying to find, um, the, what's it called the happy, uh, setup for yourself and your snakes. And yeah, you know, I think really, you know, knowing your snakes, it's a very important part. Um, it, there's no one general term on how to do something, especially for yeah. these, uh, uh, animals and stuff. 
And um, each individual animal within a species can act different. So you really have to just like, you have to learn, you have to see, you have to observe, you have to learn. Um, you know, I'm able to learn things with all my animals and then you, you kind of get it down. I'm sure as your collection, as a collection grows, you start to lose insight on individuality with certain animals. But, uh, you know, you, yeah, again, you, you start to pick up on things. Yeah. That, you know what, man, that's a good point, Joe. It, it, that's, that's one thing that I've have been like really thinking since last year, since I started, you know, having clutches and stuff of that. It's like, what's that magic number that I can still have very, um, very, uh, I'm going to say control because you can't control these. Bro, it's, it, and it, it it's, well, it's nothing against you. You, you can't like you, you can't expect yeah. to know like with uh, dude, you produce 108 animals last year. It's mm -hmm. like, how do you know what each and every baby is doing? Sure. As that, as, that whole back number slims down and then in your head you're like well this is one of my 23s mm -hmm. like then maybe you might start learning especially mm -hmm. on your holdbacks but um no nah, man i i mean once you get to that higher level of yeah production especially your baby's kind of just you know you you have to make notes or or do something oh yeah i mean yeah I'm a, I'm, um, you're a husbandry pro guy i'm a hundred pro guy and um i live by that man it's like everything's logged in i can go back and check and stuff like that um I, I i don't know how i would keep everything straight if i didn't have that um but but what i'm talking about is like just in the sheer numbers of breeders holdbacks and stuff like that because what i've seen too is like um you know sometimes you over extend and you overgrow and then you run into a lot of problems right yeah um, yeah but but then you don't know until you run into those problems right so it's like right it's like hindsight like you don't really know um so alvaro might if people keep tempting him yeah that's all I'll um say. that's definitely <laughs> on the top three list uh i think for this year so uh maybe you know we'll, we'll see summer i might have some we'll see yeah not for me just uh yeah yeah not joe. the not the animal i got yeah, I, I have joe, rhinos yeah have, joe with the I other have, route <laughs> I, have the, I have the cooler horn snake sorry <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that 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 was a uh, that 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 uh debate went different way in our group chat, man. Yeah, you I know. know. <laughs> <laughs> I have the one that doesn't make your hand swell if it chews on you. That's another, yeah, man. You know, that's a, that's a great topic. Uh, we're definitely gonna cover. Uh, later I, on. Yeah, I think we should save that for another for yeah. a whole episode by itself and just talk man. about talk about rear fang venomous because it it is an interesting topic in itself. Yeah. It is. The so we definitely glue broids. Yeah, we're gonna we're covering all that. If you guys are interested in that, we're definitely gonna cover a topic. Um, I did a quick back again. I'm plugging my my uh YouTube. I did a maybe like last month. I did a video on how to remove a hog nose, um, and I quickly skimmed over you know venom and stuff like that. Um, I'm not an expert on venom because I don't keep you know dangerous venomous. Um, yeah. you know, stuff like that, but um, I did do some research and stuff like that, and um, what was it called? And and I think, like I said, we're going to talk about that deep into another episode. And I did a quick overview. Um, that's another thing, too, is um, for hog nose, it's pretty easy to get them off of you. Um, yeah, so go ahead and check that out as well. Um, Joe, what, what about with your channel? What's, what's going on, man, that with your channel that you want people to go and, ch and yeah, check out? Yeah, so um. Meteoric Serpents on YouTube. Uh pretty simple. Um, I post YouTube videos. I you know what? I came into 2024 saying I wanted to go like weekly or do something pretty often, and it just doesn't pan out that way, man. I don't have a large enough collection to have enough content to go weekly. Could I go out and and do the most? I could do a bunch of stuff. I, I've been wanting to go herping. I'd like to make a video out of that, but um, yeah. There's not enough content within my collection to do a video every week, which is cool. So I'll sporadically upload here or there. Like I, I do enjoy making the YouTube videos and I, and I set out to make that what I've really been doing and what I've really been focused on. And is part of the reason why MJ has me here um, is I have the Colubrid corruption podcast, which is my solo podcast endeavor uh, on that channel. I go live on every Sunday at 7 30 PM EST 
It's probably going to be slightly later this weekend because of Easter. Um, but yeah, man, I just bring guests on. We do a one-on-one -on -one interview style type of thing. And I really just like to ask about their collection and kind of just some, uh, you know, engaging, intriguing questions just to really have good conversations with people about Colubrids and, and what's going on in the hobby. So uh, that's the goal of that podcast. I've had some really awesome guests on and I can't thank them enough. One of them, which includes Alvaro. So if you want to hear that feel free to go check it out he was episode number three i think so yeah we're on uh we're doing episode 20 this week so yeah. that's cool yeah that, that's one thing man. i gotta give you props man is um you're not you're not maybe you're not doing the um the you know the uploads on just your your day-to-day -day stuff but you've yeah. been non-stop and you know be very consistent with the, your podcast thanks um, man but, and, and it's I unfortunately difficult. missed one week and i and i hate that i even did yeah. i i like I, unfortunately a couple people cancel on me like two weeks in a row which which sucks and it, i hold nothing against yeah. them but uh you're, you're yeah, gonna have to start what uh, it is. double booking like the airlines do man I, <laughs> <laughs> you might be right damn you know so yeah but you know you, you've been killing it man I, I think that was um definitely hit an untapped uh you know uh, you know space in, into like the reptile YouTube yeah, stuff. for sure. And I, dude, I love this. I love this live podcast thing. Like I, I've always said, like MJ is my, I, I give him all the props in the world because he's absolutely my inspiration. Like the way my podcast is structured and, and even using StreamYard and some of the graphics I do, it, it's modeled off of him. So I, I really have to thank him. Uh, so thank you, bro. But like you, you inspired me a lot to do what I'm doing and it kind of helped give myself the confidence when I didn't think I had a voice to just go ahead and do it. Um, and it's had relative success. And yeah. uh, again, that carries into why me and you are here. We do our own shows like uh, you and I enjoy talking. So um, it's just awesome to be, you know, a part of this network and, and be able to talk colubrids to potentially a different group of people. But yeah. 100 percent man that, like I was, you said you you took the word out of my mouth man like that's why we're here man you know the trap talk network it's you know the coolest reptile network in the world man and um yeah and he, he's been growing it the last year man he's been hitting it hard killing he's it. been growing it killing it um you know are, are, are we seven days a week now or six so far six, six i, I right? know he has plans for sundays yeah. thanks for interfering with my pod mj no i'm joking dog <laughs> yeah. um no, but yeah, we. Uh, I know he's good. He has plans to do something on Sunday, but it's six days a week wow. as of now, Monday through Saturday. One hundred percent, yeah, man. So yeah. It, it's a blessing to be part of this. Um, you know, it, it's it's helping us. That we, you know, you know, growing our own things, and hopefully, it helps somebody here be able to, you know, give a couple more uh, insights on different species and different insights. Um, you know, because we have, you know, on the other spectrum, we have um, Junior uh yeah. the other fridays and Junior's yeah, by the been... way shout, shout out to to jeff jr whatever you want to yep. call him jmg uh he held it down the last two fridays we're going to be doing this on and off every other week if you didn't hear that at the beginning uh we're just alternating with him so next friday you'll see him and then in two fridays we'll we'll be back but uh yep. yeah so yeah. you know so and awesome. he, like i said he's on the other spectrum of being into hog nose and the reptile world for probably double maybe triple the time that we have been in right like i don't know man he's been in keeping for a very i mean he's about my age and he's been keeping since he was like a young you know 10 11 year old bro and, and when it comes to hognose he's just like like what you have to say he's he's levels above everyone else man and, and you know what it is it's just the sheer time that he's put into it there's no way around getting that um around getting you know it's the time we're dealing with, you know, we're dealing with live animals. We were dealing with creatures yeah. and stuff like that. You can't mass, you know, produce, um, I mean, you can, but you're going to see the effects of it. Um, there's no way to rush the time. Um, you know, so it, it's put in the reps. That's really it. Man, yeah. With anything, yeah. right. Anything in life. Um, so yeah, he, he's, he's just so knowledgeable, man. And, um, I have a couple animals from him. Um, one of my biggest investments, um, is from him um you know okay yeah i, I, yeah, still, yeah, ha yeah. I still haven't released it because it's, it's in my uh quarantine right now quarantine right yeah yeah um but here in the next couple months i'll release it to the world and, and see awesome. what i got from there 
Um, you know, and, and then one of these Fridays, we'll probably do all three of us and uh, get Junior on here and talk, you know. Yeah, I and, and guys, uh, for whoever's listening to this long, I, I made some suggestions to MJ about what we can do with this Friday show. And, and I'm kind of excited. I think it's some good ideas. And besides even just Colubrid talk, I think there's some things that we can do as a network. And, and Friday is... You know, I, in my opinion, probably the best day of the week to do it, uh, where we as a network can come together and, and have almost big events, maybe some stuff with U.S. Arc. I don't want to put words in the network's mouth, but uh, I, I, I think we should we can do some cool stuff. Um, yeah. And I'm just again, I'm just really excited to be a part of this. So, yeah. A hundred percent, man. Yeah, man. I mean, right before the show, we we're checking U.S. Arc stuff. Um, you know, thankfully, there was nothing major that. uh you know, came up in the last week or so, um, you know, so, you know, but you never know, you never know when something comes up with that, we can talk about that, uh, you know, what's going on with our collections and dive deep more into specifics about, you know, every species that we keep, um, especially yeah. you, Joe, you know, you have a handful of colubrids. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, that was awesome. It's been a great hour and, and 50 minutes or so. We've we've averaged, I'd say, about 30 people this entire time, and we've probably had anywhere from 40 to 50 people across the entire uh, thing. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Alvaro, do you have anything else to, to leave people um, on? I mean, thank you. Tune in to all the, you know, Monday through Saturday here on the Trap Network, um, yeah. you know. Go ahead and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channels. Go follow us on social media. Keep up with what's going on uh, in our breeding season this year. Because I know Joe's going to have some heat that he's dropping. Um, Colubrids and ball python stuff. You know, yep. we can plug that in. Hell yeah. Um, and I have some pretty cool triple recessive hats and uh, visual stuff that I'm, you know, keeping my fingers crossed and that, you know, they come out to fruition. So, again, yeah. thank you guys for watching. Make sure you subscribe. Hit the like button right now if you haven't. Yeah. And guys, uh, like I said, we have some cool ideas for episodes in the future, kind of structured that out. So make sure you're tuned in and about, uh, well, not in about in two weeks, we'll be back on here, but guys, for now, this has been episode number three of thank God it's colubrids. I am Joe. I was hosting today with Alvaro from Clover's reptiles. I'm Joe with meteoric serpents. Thank you guys for tuning in. Have a great night. Peace out. We'll see you guys in the next one.